Well, <clears throat> I'm not feeling well. I haven't felt well for a while, and yet I'm so happy to be here. And uh, so I don't know. I can, you can pray for strength to finish up today. So, A passion worth sharing. Last week, uh, I'm going to sit down. Last week, uh, part one, and we're going to continue this discussion on the whys and the hows of sharing our faith. So some of it is exhortation, and some of it is very practical. Uh, and this week I, I had to practice what I preach, and it even came to my mind as getting my hair cut. And as you know, I'm often sharing the gospel everywhere I go, and I thought, well, I just preached about it last Sunday. I'm going to do it. So I uh, was able to talk about Christ, and, and uh, I noticed that as I was talking to the person cutting my hair that the other conversations had all died down and everybody was listening. And, and I always uh, try to be... Uh, to, to be winsome, uh, and then uh, was able to give some invitations to church, and we'll see what happens. But uh, I know that many people in our church uh, feel like they are like a great prophet. You're all thinking, what? I know that you guys think of yourselves like the great prophet Moses. I do sometimes, too. Great prophet Moses, we think we're just like him. In Exodus 4, 10 through 13, the great prophet Moses says, Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, <laughs> neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I wasn't eloquent before you started talking to me, and I'm not eloquent since you started talking to me. I am slow of speech and tongue. So, you know, a lot of times we feel like Moses, don't we? Lord God, I'm not. Can't you use somebody else to share the gospel? I'm really not a speaker. I'm really not, not good at sharing my faith. The Lord said to him, who gave you that mouth? <laughs> who makes uh, the deaf deaf or the mute mute? Who gives uh, somebody sight or somebody else blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. <laughs> Have you not ever felt like Moses yeah, of course we want people to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Of course we want people to know that God is good, that he loves them, that he'll forgive all their sins. Of course, right? And God, can't you send somebody else? I'm not good at it. That's not my gift. We, we were talking about that this week. You know, Navy SEALs, they've each got a different job to do. Everybody's highly trained. And you could say, well, and they all need to function in order to get their job done. And the Bible talks about people having different gifts, and it talks about evangelism. That means not everybody's an evangelist. But you know what? Every Navy SEAL's got to learn how to shoot his gun. And the Bible talks about some people have the gift of mercy or the gift of giving, and yet aren't we all called to be merciful and all called to give? In the same way, there are some things that are called evangelists. They are beautiful to behold. They are bold, they are brave, they are eloquent. And everywhere they go, piles of people are coming to the Lord all the time. I love that. That's not me. I'm, I'm more of a plotter. I, I told you I've been able to play with dozens, maybe over 100 some people in my life, and it's all because of effort and a lot of rejection because I don't think I have the gift of evangelism, but I keep plotting and I keep sharing the love of God everywhere I go, and it's not our place to say, oh, Lord, please send somebody else. Brothers and sisters, I'm not saying it's wrong to say that prayer. Sometimes, Lord, I really feel inadequate to the task. You're going to need to bring more people. You're going to bring, need to bring somebody else. But, Lord, I will do my part. You have me here for a reason. You see how we pivoted on that? Don't just end with, Lord, oh, Lord, send more workers. Oh, Lord, send somebody else. Those are good prayers. But, Lord God, here I am. Use me. Send me. Amen? We want people to know the goodness and the love of God. We want people to know that there is forgiveness for their sins. We want people to know that, that God just didn't leave us in doubt about heaven and hell and the things eternal. He's opened up his heart to us and he wants us to know because God loves us. Uh, last week, I'm going to do a short recap of what we saw last week. We stressed that to share the gospel, we have to know what it is. And here's a big thing. A lot of times Christians make this mistake. They, they, they think that they're called to make clones of themselves, uh, that everybody has to think like me, dress like me, talk like me. Uh, 
But what we're actually called to do is to call people to surrender themselves to Jesus Christ. We're supposed to begin to look like Jesus Christ. Uh, the example I gave is I was blessed to work with a number of Muslims when I was overseas. Uh, many of them would even come sometimes. I did the marriage ceremony for a Muslim couple. Uh, another, uh, some people were coming to the worship service I was leading. And, uh, and I kept sharing the gospel, and most of them did not believe. But one of them uh, got to a point where he put his faith in Jesus Christ. But first, he was always very critical of the United States. I love my country. I defend my country. But you know what? I, uh, I knew that either I could talk to him about Jesus or I could argue with him every time about the United States. So what I did was, was to say, listen, the United States is a young country. We've got 200 years of error. Persia's an old country. You've got a lot more things to repent of. Uh, he was a Muslim from, per from in Iran. And, uh, however, I don't want to talk about what countries are doing right or wrong because you know that you're a sinner and you're wrong before holy God and you need to get right. And so I brought it back to Jesus Christ and I just kept talking to him. And every time he tried to draw me out and get me to fight about politics or something, our current events, I just kept coming back to, he needs a savior, you need a savior, you need a savior. Uh, my job is not to make, when I was overseas for eight and a half years, to make many Americans. Anybody I was talking to, my job was to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Uh, and not just missionaries, that's all of our jobs. That's why I'm bringing it up right now. So we have to make sure what the gospel is. The gospel, if, if, you're a, uh, 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 if your politics leans Democrat, your job is not to make more Democrats. If your politics leans Republican, your job is not to bring more Republicans. Your job, our job is to bring people to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Uh, so let's be sure we know what the gospel is. Uh, and it's not moralism. I want people not to get drunk. I want people not to use drugs. I want people to stop sleeping around. I, all these things will lead them to a happier life. And these are things we teach to believers. But I don't care if I get non-believers to behave and they still don't love Jesus. We have to get people to repent so that they can get saved and, and be forgiven and have eternal life. So we're not pushing moralism. We're pushing a relationship. We're sharing a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're not riding in on a high horse so we can talk to the, to the heathen. Look at how wonderful I am. And uh, no... I got to heaven where? I got holes in my pants. I got to heaven on my knees. I don't ride anywhere on a high horse. And you've, we've heard the phrase many, many times, sharing our faith is like one beggar talking to another beggar where they found a feast. We have found a feast here, brothers and sisters. This doesn't mean we're wonderful. It means we've met a wonderful God. And we need to share this with everyone we can. And of course, then God changes our lives. Of course, the Holy Spirit has an effect. You know, we've said about, talked about this before. You do not meet a semi-trailer going down the highway and not get altered by that connection. You meet a semi-trailer, you are changed. God is a lot bigger than a semi-trailer. You meet the living God, it's going to have an imprint on your life. There will be change. But first things first, we need to introduce people uh, to that living God. Uh, my job is not just to get people to behave right. It's to love God with everything they've got inside them. Then the behavior, guess what? It's going to change. When people start loving God and putting him first, they're going to make different choices in their lives. So we saw that this surrender is typically portrayed with four essential elements. This is the gospel. Brothers, sisters, you need to get this down because Maybe you say, I'm always talking about Jesus, but I've never got to pray with somebody. Well, maybe you haven't really shared the gospel. The things you're sharing are good, but you need to share the good news of how people can move from a state of being lost to being found, a place of living in darkness to a place of living in the light, a place from uh, on a highway to hell. You know, Jesus Christ said it's the wide road that leads to hell, right? But it's a narrow path, and few find it, Jesus said. We need to introduce people to this narrow path. And so what is involved in that narrow path? One, we all have to know that we're sinners. We're all sinners. And when you talk about this, I would, I'd like to recommend you lead with your own sin. Because if you just say, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. Now, there's a place for that. But if that's all people hear, they're not going to hear the grace of Jesus. What they're going to hear is you think you're better than them. Maybe you don't. 
think that. Maybe you say, I'm broken by the fall. Praise Jesus. He's helping me to put my life back together, but all the glory goes to him. And you, maybe you don't feel that arrogant. Maybe you're not full of yourself. But if all they hear is condemnation, they're not going to hear the grace of Jesus. So talk about your own sin. Say, this is what I was struggling with. This is what I still struggle with. I'm a broken person, but God loved me anyways. And Jesus knows all my sins. So talk about your own sin, and then you earn the or you earn the right to then to talk about their sin because they need to, to, to understand that they're sinners. It's again, it's like an airplane, okay? Everybody with me? It's like an airplane. If you're on an airplane and it's flying along just nice and you tell somebody, why don't you wear this backpack? It's really cool. And you can say, come to our backpack wearing club because we have free pizza. Maybe they'll come a couple times. But that big backpack is really uncomfortable they're going to say, you know what, we have pizza over here and we don't have to wear backpacks. We have, we have fun times over here and we sing songs that are actually on the radio and not songs that you guys just think are cool. It, and we tell them, no, you got to wear the backpack because it's fun. They're going to say, come to a point, you know what, this is not about fun. This is, I'm not going to wear this backpack. You need to let them know, look out the window, see the ground, it's getting close. See the fire out those, about those engines? The plane is on fire, this backpack is a parachute. And they're going to say, oh, what, you know what? <laughs> Maybe I do want this. And people don't know they'll need that backpack unless they know the place is on fire. People won't know that they need salvation unless uh, they know they're drowning. People won't accept that invitation from the fireman to get out of the burning house unless they know their house is on fire. And people won't accept a Savior who died for their sins unless they know that they have sins. Make sense? So brothers and sisters, don't just talk about, I mean, we, there's so many things we talk about that are good, but they're not the gospel. If you love somebody and want them to go to heaven, we need to share the gospel. One, we're all sinners. Do you love people enough to let them know? Number two, we can't save ourselves. Remember last week I talked about Looney Tunes? The Bugs Bunny cartoons, when you're drowning in the water, what do Looney Tunes do? They grab their ears and they pull themselves out of the water. Or you, you're running, you go off a cliff, what do you do? You grab your hair and you pull yourself up. That works only in cartoons. We are drowning because of our sin. Because of our sin, the Bible says we're dead already. We are dead in our sins. And we can't save ourselves. That why, that's why we need somebody in a boat, somebody who's not falling down that cliff, we need somebody who's not in the same situation than us. That's why the only, the only Savior had to be sinless. So one, we're all sinners. Number two, we can't save ourselves. And, and I, I, I want you to think of, we've talked about this diagram a lot. Some of you have seen it, some of you haven't seen it before. Imagine there's a cliff right over here, okay? Here's a cliff. And here's an open spot right here, and the cliff goes down far, and then there's another cliff over here. Humanity is over here. This is where people are. God is over there. Eternal life is over there. Heaven is over there. How am I going to get over there? Well, some of you think, well, if you're really good. And so we've got, we've got somebody who's really good, like, like uh, Bob Euchert, almost sinless, right? And, so, and, and by the way, Bob Euchert, you could be the radio guy or the guy we got. Either one, it's the same, almost sinless. Say, so go running over here. Uh, God's over there. Take the best jump they can. Human effort, human effort, human effort. Uh, Boosh. Didn't make it. And then here I come, and I'm tripping and stumbling. And, oh, I trip down the face, and I'm getting knocked down. And, and then here Yumi comes, and she's, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And not even my lovely wife Yumi makes it all the way over to the side. So then you think, well, maybe, maybe Michael Jackson, because he's got mad hops, you know, and whatever. And, and maybe some scientist, because his life is dedicated to it. Maybe, you know, a monk or something. Nobody can ever make it over there. Why is that? Well, the Bible says we all suffer from sin, and we're all separate from the glory of God. We all fall short. So if we can't get over there, we're all going to hell. Okay, end of the message. Or, or if we can't reach up to heaven, maybe God can reach down to us. And that's what the whole cross is about. And on the cross, Jesus Christ died for my sins and yours. With his nail-scarred hand, he reached down and says, I can save you. Grab a hold of my hand. And either we're going to say, no, I'm going to do it my way, blah, 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 and I'm drowning out of the water. Or we can say, thank you, and grab a hold of the salvation that God is offering. And so we've got one cliff over here, one cliff over there is God, and Jesus Christ laid down a bridge, which is the cross, his own life. On the cross, he provided a way for us to be made right with God. 
That little diagram, you can teach that now. You can teach that now. And I gave you the story last week how I wrote it on a napkin once for, for a woman in Japan and gave it to her. Her daughter-in-law, her, her daughter had said, He'll, she'll never become a Christian. She'll never want to go to church. And I said, well, we'll see. She ended up bringing that crumpled napkin to me one day, and she still had it, and I had forgotten I'd even written it. But she had kept it and thought about it again and again, and she accepted the Lord and got saved. Brothers and sisters, you can teach what I just taught about those two cliffs right now. Uh, then the third one, we already talked about on the cross, Jesus Christ paid for our sins. And number four, it doesn't do any good to have a bridge unless you take a step of faith. you got to take a step on that bridge. Now, you hear a lie that the world and Hollywood and Des Disney movies, they're always saying all the time, it says, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you, as long as you believe. And it doesn't matter who you put your faith in as long as you have faith. That does not make sense. I'm like 260-some pounds. It doesn't ha matter how much faith I have if I plop down on this chair. It's either going to hold me or not. My faith only matters up to the point of being willing to sit down. See? After that, what matters is the strength of the chair. It's like walking on ice. I don't care how much you, you, you psych yourself up to it. Ooh, I'm going to do this. I have a strong faith. I'm going to walk. And, the, and it's just newly, it's just started fall. And there's flowing water underneath. It doesn't matter how much faith you have. You step out on that ice, you're going under the water. But let's say you're not really sure and you've got just a little bit of faith. You say, I know I'm a sinner and I need help, Lord. I don't know. I just don't know. And you take and you... You sense something, and the Holy Spirit's calling. You say, okay, I'm going to answer that call. You take a step out. If that ice is thick, it holds you. The object of faith matters more than the faith itself once you take, a, once you take that first step. Brothers and sisters, we need to help people. We, need our, we ourselves need to take a step on that bridge, and we need to invite other people to take a step on that bridge. That's the fourth one. By faith, we receive forgiveness and eternal life. In... Uh, Next week is going to be part three of uh, Passion We're Sharing. I'm going to share a lot more personal stories than this morning. But uh, I grew up sharing my faith, always saw that we desperately needed to get people uh, right with the Lord, get them into church. As in grade school, I was sharing my faith. Uh, junior high school, I was sharing my faith. In high school, I really started to share my faith all the time. But I had very little, I, had, I was good at apologetics, and I liked to talk about things scientifically and philosophically, and I did that and did that till I was blue in my face, and I got to pray with a couple people here and there to become believers. It wasn't until after I'd finished college, and I'd lived a life of sharing my faith, and there was a few people I could point to that were now walking with Christ, but I went to a, a conference of Campus Crusade for Christ, and there were... Uh, I think 30,000 young people there. Huge conference, and it was in Korea, South Korea. And almost everybody's Korean. There was a small contingent from Japan, a few dozens. And then I was the only native English speaker. And it was really cool. We sat out in the sun, in the rain, singing in Korean. The messages were in Korean. We were on a beach side. Uh, most people were in tents. We ate octopus tentacle soup for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I became seriously ill on the, on, the, on the airplane ride home. I was throwing up, and yet that event changed my life. And one of the things I realized, uh, oh, by the way, they had earphones, and they had special translation on several of the sermons just for me. Isn't that cool? 30,000 people in Korea. Uh, one of the things I learned was I had always been telling people about Jesus, but I never, I wasn't really effective at saying, now would you like to put your faith in Jesus? Would you like to pray with me? Taking that next step in helping people, guiding people, because people are there. And a lot of times I realize people are actually hoping, can, can we do this? Can we pray? And I was never inviting them to pray. Brothers and sisters, I can't stress this strong enough. These four steps, and then ask people, does this sound good to you? Does this sound like something you want to do? Don't you want to be made right with the Lord? Wouldn't you like to start living for the Lord now? Would you like to pray with me? 
And then I usually get them to pray out loud too. I usually say, now I'm going to pray and don't be embarrassed. This is okay, but I'm going to ask you to pray out loud too. And, I'm gonna, and I want you to say thank you for the cross. And I want you to confess your sins to God. And so going through these, these, uh, these four steps and then asking people to actually pray. Uh, other points from last week. Uh, brothers and sisters, spend your life and your influence wisely. I don't know how much longer any of us have on this planet. You could get hit, I could get hit by a car today. Any time. Uh, some meteorite size of this could come shooting through and, you know, that was a little more graphic than I... I did not sit at home thinking, I'm going to go like this. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, the thing is, is we... Death is messy, and we go out of this life very rarely dignified. Life is, death is messy. Life is, death is difficult. And uh, I want to make my days count. Why waste my days doing things that don't matter? Why spend all my time and effort following, chasing some idol of, of self-satisfaction or whatnot? There are things we do with our lives, and it's a waste. Spend your life wisely, and brothers and sisters, use your influence wisely. Uh, you have influence with people around you, maybe at work, maybe if you're still at school. Be wise, don't be obnoxious, but look and pray for opportunities to share your faith. And sometimes I see Christians so cautious that they're trying to set somebody up to talk to about Jesus year after year after year, and they never share their faith. I think it's the difference between shooting a, a, a rifle and shooting a shotgun. A rifle, you're targeting one person, you've got a scope, and you're just trying to, yeah, but you don't know how they're going to respond to your invitation. I think it's much better just get some shot out there. Send the gospel out to everybody you can, and you're going to tag somebody. Somebody's going to want to hear about Jesus. And, and if you are a person who's always sharing your faith, you're going to get a lot of rejection, but somebody's going to say yes. Uh, so use your influence wisely. And why would you ever leave a job without inviting people to church, without telling people about your faith in Jesus Christ? Why would you ever leave a neighborhood without doing that? Why would you ever uh, leave your school without doing that? Because you're not going to have that much influence over these pennies, people anyways. Take your wad, blow it right there. I'm going I'm to do what I can to win people to Christ right here, right now. We only have so much influence, and what are you using it for? Business, that's fine. It's not bad. Earn a little money, that's fine. That's not evil. In fact, as a Christian, go out there and, and earn money. Work hard. I always believe Christians should be hard workers. But what do you spend your influence on so people can think you're cool? I want people to think I'm intellectual so I can be accepted. So that the people who are on the highway to hell say, well, he's a Christian, but he's cool. See, that's a trap. People say that to me sometimes, and right away I get cold, like, oh, no, that's dangerous. Because now the temptation for me is to never say anything that will make them dislike me. Well, I want to love them enough that I'm going to tell them something uncomfortable. It's like sleepwalking. If I saw somebody sleepwalking to the edge of the staircase, you're going to say, oh, no, they get angry when you wake them up. I'm not going to say anything. Or would you just love them enough to say, no, 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 you've got you to move away from those stairs. If people are sleepwalking on their way to hell, do I love them enough to try and rouse them, even if they're going to say, Dan, you're a jerk, and I, I don't really like you trying to wake me up? Brothers and sisters, you only have so many days. You only have so much influence. Use it for the Lord. Use it for the Lord. A challenge uh, of our faith we're challenging our faith to share more. We want to ask ourselves questions like, uh, can I be more obedient? We never want to stop growing in obedience, right? Don't, don't say, I've arrived. Don't say, I've done this this way for five years. I've been a Christian five years or, or 20 years or 30 years, and so therefore I'm not going to change. Is there something I can surrender to? Can I become more obedient in this? Have I grown in my desire to share my faith? Jesus Christ died to open up heaven's doors for people. If I'm loving Jesus, aren't I going to start loving other people enough to share the gospel with them? Come on, guys. That's, that's logical, right? I love God. I want to love God's people. Jesus died for people. I want to live to share Jesus with other people. So have I been growing in my desire to share my faith? 
Uh, again, scatter seed everywhere. Shoot that shotgun wide in our homes, in the marketplace, uh, wherever people gather. I've shared my faith standing in line at a post office. I've shared my faith standing in line at the grocery store in, uh, to different degrees. I mean, you don't have a time to share the whole gospel usually in those settings. But I, I, I was able to bring one guy to church from the post office, and we ended up getting like four or five more people through him. And so we had a whole contingent from people that were originally brought from the post office. <coughs> Excuse me. The marketplace, wherever people gather to talk and share ideas. For most of human history, that's been up, person, close, personal, up close and personal. And honestly, we're, we're, we're on television, right? Uh, you guys know we used to be on two television channels, but then we had to stop one because of financial reasons. We're still on one channel, but wouldn't you know it, since we stopped, two different people have come up to me. I was just in the movies this week. I went to see Paddington Bear uh, with, who did I see Paddington with? Megumi, yeah. And it was a great time. And uh, when I'm getting my popcorn, the gal said, you guys aren't on TV anymore? She said, I was watching your show all the time. And uh, she said, I've been looking around for it. Did you change the time? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, so wouldn't you know it? And then we were talking about uh, getting out of the newspaper to save a little money. And then today somebody told me they found us in the newspaper. And like uh, three weeks ago, somebody was here and told me they found us in the newspaper. So I don't know. That's maybe a little interesting. But anyways, personal invitation. This is what I'm going to. Brothers and sisters, if we're not on the television as much as we used to be, if we're, not, if we're pulling back, we're not in the yellow pages, we canceled a couple of those. Listen, it's, how is our church going to grow? How are more people going to know about Jesus? Point at yourself, look around, people beside you, ahead of you, behind you. I said ahead of you, but that didn't make any sense. Ahead of you, behind you. I'm talking too quick. Uh, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, uh, God's primary means to share the gospel is you and I. Let's share the love of Jesus with everybody we can. Uh, there are other means, but primarily it's always been personal, face-to-face. -face. Uh, but for some of us, more and more, just within the last 15 years or so, we do more of our interactions with people online. And that's not supposed to be a substitute with talking to somebody face-to-face. -face. But we need to grab a hold of every opportunity to share our faith. And one of the ways we can share Jesus is we've got thousands of hits if you add up all of our sermons especially when we, we used to get more hits before. But, but if you add up all the hits of our, of our sermons, our sermons go out not only across the United States, but around the world. Uh, and then on things like Facebook, more and more of us do our interactions at line. We need to take the clear gospel of the cross of Christ everywhere we go. And I shared with you, some of you maybe don't even know this story yet. Uh, some of you know that I'm very active with sharing my faith on Facebook, especially with atheists and Muslims. And uh, a couple years ago, a fellow who was a rabid uh, Hindu, very angry against Muslims, a lot of hatred, was attacking Muslims all the time. And I sometimes would go outside to him and tell him, you know, brother, I don't know if this is the right way to have the conversation. But I kept sharing love, Jesus with a lot of love. And gradually he started talking to me and he turned out he had some Christians in his family, and for about a year, a year and a half, he kept saying, don't worry, Pastor, I'm going to be a Christian. You're, you're leading me. I'm going to be a Christian, but he never would. He never would go to church, and finally I got an email from him and saying, I've been going to church. I wanted you to know I've gotten baptized, and you were the one who opened this door for me. Thank you so much. He lives in India. And then another fella recently got back to me who was a Muslim, and because I'm cynical, I thought, because there's some trickery going on online sometimes. I thought he was a little bit tricky, and he wrote to me and said, I'm a Muslim, uh, but I want to become a Christian. Can you tell me how? I've been watching you online. And I thought, yeah, right. But I shared him the gospel, and he said he accepted the Lord. And I've been, said so the last year or so, all his posts have been about Christianity. He's very bold to talk about Jesus and trying to lead others. He's going to church, and he sent me an email saying thank you so much. And so we can reach people in other countries, both these people were overseas through social media. Where did Paul and Jesus go? They went to the marketplace. Where do we go to the marketplace? Yes, it's your physical connections. It's also, where do you do most of your talking, your connections? Is it Facebook? 
Is it, is it Twitter? Is it some other social media? Is it YouTube? Uh, whatever. I was watching CNN this week. I'm a, I'm a news junkie. And, and the comment was made that ISIS' most powerful weapon was not guns and bombs, but social media. And if ISIS can use social media, and if they care enough about their warped, depraved agenda to be winning, literally tens of thousands of people have been won to their cause through Facebook and Twitter. They're getting financial support from all around the world. They're getting soldiers by the thousands that they've won through Facebook and Twitter. CNN says their most powerful weapon is not guns and bombs, but social media. Specifically, CNN said Facebook and Twitter. Thousands of people swayed to their worldview. Why are they so effective? They're passionate. Well, the depraved world likes to hear a depraved message, yes. But they're passionate about what they believe, and they're not afraid of what people think. They're not afraid of people's opinion of them. They are not subtle. They're not trying to, you know, uh, they're, they're very blatant about the wicked things that they believe. Uh, and they don't take half measures because they think they're in a war. Now, they're just fighting over a bunch of sand. They're fighting over a bunch of oil. They're fighting over territory. Uh, their goal is to win. So what is my goal when people's eternal destiny hangs in the balance? Brothers and sisters, what's our goal as a church? What is our goal? What am I using my influence for? To, to make people like my style of music? To make people like the fashion of clothes I wear? Brothers, sisters, I cannot speak about this strongly enough. We need to wake up. Share your faith. I feel so inadequate to this message. What is our goal? What do we really believe? Do we believe, Daniel 12, 2, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt? Jesus said there's a highway, a broad road that leads to hell. But narrow is the road, and few will find it that leads to heaven. Do I believe that? And if I found that road, what is wrong with me? If I don't try to say, come here, brothers, sisters, friends, there's a road, there's forgiveness. There's a way to being right with God. Let's share this faith with everybody because nothing else in life matters like sharing your faith, like winning people to Jesus Christ. A good football team obeys the coach. If they don't, they ain't a good football team. An efficient military obeys the chain of command. If you're a Christian, you have a king. Listen to what your king said. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, he's talking to all of us, all who believe. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples means teaching them everything that's in here, teaching them to follow it and obey it, like we're doing this morning, right? It's not say, try to trick everybody into saying a magic prayer. I believe in Jesus. Please forgive my sins. I don't want to think about you for the rest of my life, but now I can go to heaven. He never says that. He says, teach them to be disciples, followers. Go and make disciples of all nations. The nations, again, means ethnos. It's where we get our word ethnicity from. The church of Christ should be red and yellow, black and white. I love salt and pepper churches. We want to fill up our churches with people from every color, every background, uh, every social class, every educational level, every income level, everybody. Fill us up. Bring everybody to Jesus. And he says, and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and he goes on and teach them to obey what? Everything that I've commanded you. And he says, this is a big job, so I want you to know, surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Because that's important. Because this job is too big for us. Too big for me, too big for you, too big for our church. Thank the Lord he's with us. And listen to what God says to all Christians in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12. God says, you are chosen people. Are you a Christian? You're part of a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Well, I'm not a pastor. I can't. I'm not a missionary. I'm not an evangelist. You are a royal priesthood. You love Jesus. You're part of a chosen people, a, ro a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation, a people that belong to God. And why? That you may declare. God chose you that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. We've been moved from darkness to light, and God did this so that we will declare his praises everywhere we go. We belong to God. Let's declare 
his praises. Uh, verse 10 then says, Once you were not a people, uh, but now you are the people of God. Once you did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you. So if, if God can urge us through, through Paul, that's why I'm being so urgent today. It's, it's for a purpose. Dear friends, I urge you. Live as an alien in this world, as a stranger. Abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. In verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that although they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. There's two elements here. Did you see them? One, the second one is live good. The first one that was mentioned was declare God's praises. This is called lifestyle evangelism, virtue apologetics. Talk it and live it. Don't say, I just live it. I don't have to talk it. No, then who gets the glory for being good? You, not God. If God's going to get the glory for you being good, they've got to know God is the reason for the choices you make in your life. So talk Jesus and live Jesus. That's what we just saw in 1 Peter. Nothing I'm saying this morning, I'm making up. Two elements, living and talking. Lifestyle evangelism, virtual Virtue apologetics. And when you're in battle, you know, ISIS isn't just putting down their guns. When you're in a battle and we're battling for the souls of human beings, don't put down your sword. What's the pastor saying? We need so No, no, no. We're talking about the sword of the Lord, okay? I, ho I hope everybody got that. The sword of the Lord. When, when, you don't say repent or die. That, they're going to say whatever they want. And that doesn't mean they love Jesus, right? Well, you can't. You can't force people to love God. Uh, but this is our sword. This is our sword. And even if the, if the enemy mocks you and says, oh, your sword's ineffective, it doesn't work against me, don't put it down. The world's always telling Christians, well, you can't use the Bible to talk about your faith. Oh, the Bible says it's the sword of the Lord, living act sharper than two of us. But because non-Christians say it's no good, I'm not, no, no. Hebrews 4.12, the word of the God is living. The Word of God is active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates right into a person's soul and spirit, dividing them, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. People tell me all the time, Dan, why are you quoting the Bible? You can't prove the Bible by referencing the Bible. Which is actually is not entirely true, since the Bible is not one book. This is 66 different books written by dozens of authors over a thousand years. So yes, we can reference it against each other. Otherwise, you couldn't reference any ancient text. But that's besides the point. People tell me, why are you quoting the Bible? You can't prove the Bible or reference itself. When people ask me why I'm quoting the Bible, I just answer honestly. Yeah, I wasn't expecting you to suddenly say, I believe it just because the Bible says it. Never dreamed that, honestly. I was quoting the Bible so that we could know what the Bible says on this topic. And the Bible says it's powerful. Get this word out there. So I really believe, brothers and sisters, we keep quoting the Bible and let the Bible do its stuff. Our words are not going to be more powerful than the words of Scripture. And to do that, you can't be ashamed of this book. I remember when I first started carrying this to, to school, I had a temptation. I want to put the math book on the outside of it. I, I'm being bold because I'm bringing it to school, but can I keep it in my backpack? Or can I, can I put my other books around it? And I took it, you know what? I don't care what people think. This is between me and God, and God knows I'm ashamed of his word. I put it right on the outside of my stuff and brought it to Parker. Brought it to Parker just like that uh, because I didn't want to be somebody who's ashamed. I'm going to put this Bible verse on my Facebook page because between me and the Lord, I may be uncomfortable doing that, and that's a good sign that maybe I need to grow up. Uh, I don't want to be ashamed of my God. I don't want to be ashamed of the gospel. Romans 1.16 I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is power. Power from God for the salvation. Salvation. Being saved, being forgiven, given eternal life. It's a power of salvation for everyone who believes. First for the Jew and then also for the Gentile. Why would I be ashamed of this book when it's the power of salvation for everyone? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Hebrews puts it this way in 13.6. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper I'm not going to be afraid. What can man do to me anyways? Aren't you glad that God puts that kind of verse in the Bible? Because we get afraid of people and their opinions, don't we? What am I going to be more, what, what, what do I care more about? The one who died for me? The one who created 
a trillion galaxies, each with a trillion stars, or a bunch of people who really don't like me anyways who might look down at me if I talk about Jesus. I think I've got to get my... I've got to get straight in my thinking because I'm too easily whacked out. Jesus is my priority. He loves me. He died for me. He's Lord of all. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And that's the attitude that the very first Christians had. We're going to go through a bunch of verses in the book of Acts right now. And uh, I'm going to go quickly so you can turn there or you can just listen along as I go. The very last words of Jesus, this is right, he's getting ready to go back, he's going to ascend into heaven. Heaven is not physically above the earth, but it's a, a, a higher plane, and so he shows himself rising up into the clouds, and the disciples are watching, and Jesus' last words, he could have said, what would God say before he goes up into heaven? He could have said anything, right? He could have said anything. What did Jesus choose to say? So when he met his disciples, he gathered them together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the dates of the times the Father has set of his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utmost ends of the earth. Right before he went to heaven, he says, here's what's going to happen. You few 11 guys, it's going to go boom across the whole world. It has. It has, and you and I are part of that. And we're supposed to, what's, what's my Jerusalem? Well, it will be Janesville, Milton. Rock County. Our Judea, reach out a little bit farther than that. Maybe southern Wisconsin, northern, northern Illinois. Samaria, remember, were people that were against the Jews. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. So let's think about this instead of geographically. Samaritans would be people who are not like us. Maybe they like different kind of music. Maybe they have a different skin color. Maybe they eat kind of weird food, we think. People who, who vote different than us. We've got to love them enough to take them the gospel the way the early disciples took the gospel to uh, Samaria. People that are different than us, Jesus said, go and take them the gospel all over the nation, all over the world. And again, social media is a good way for us to reach across the nation and around the world with the message of Jesus Christ. Then we're supporting missionaries through our church, and that's another good thing we can do. And we can even go on short-term missions trips, and I'd like to see us do that in the years to come. Jesus' last words before he goes back up in heaven is, get busy, get going, start sharing the gospel. Is this important to Jesus? He died for it. Is this important to you and I? Are we actively sharing our faith, looking for opportunities with the people around us? Uh, Acts 3.19 is a gospel call that you and I can use. Acts 3.19, repent then and turn to God so your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. You know, that was good 2,000 years ago. Repent. Turn to God. Your sins will be wiped out. Time's refreshing. Don't you feel a weariness? Aren't you feeling too cynical? Time's refreshing. You know that, that message? Still good 2,000 years later. Another is Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.18-20 tells how Society tried to silence the early Christians. And they got uh, Peter and John, and they put them before court in the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish ruling council, and they tried to tell them, you can't talk about Jesus anymore. Acts chapter 4. Then they called them again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, wait a second. Where is this written? Thou shalt not talk about politics and religion because it's impolite? Wait. Jesus said, go and tell everybody. I'm paraphrasing here. Our culture tells us, sit down and shut up. Don't talk about Jesus. And the devil says, yeah, don't talk about Jesus. Jesus said, talk about Jesus. We've got a choice. Like I said last week, seen too much death to play games with this gospel anymore. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. Then verse 20, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Let that be true of everybody in this room. I just can't help it. I just can't help talking about Jesus because all the miracles I've seen, all the wonderful things that have happened in my life and in our church, I can't stop talking about Jesus. Acts chapter 5, 27 through 29, having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to 
to be questioned by the high priest. So they got the apostles and brought them back again because what happened? They went out and they started talking about Jesus again. And these guys are apoplectic now. They said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with his teaching and you're trying to make us feel guilty about his blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. I've had uh, people in the last couple of years keep asking me, can you teach us about evangelism? And, and we, do, we, we generally go through the scriptures chapter by chapter, which I love to do. But I've been having this build up inside me for a while now, wanting to teach about evangelism. And I was thinking, I've got about seven hours worth of material. I pared it down uh, to about uh, maybe four that we're doing over a three-week period, four or four and a half. Uh, Acts 8, 1 through 4. Uh, tell the story of the first Christian martyr in persecution. Okay, uh, this is about Stephen. And he was the first Christian martyr, you know, after Jesus, obviously. And then after Stephen was killed for his faith, persecution broke out on the early church. In people, well, let's read. Uh, Acts 8, 1 through 4. And Saul was there. Saul later becomes Paul. <clears throat> this guy, Saul, hated Christianity, trying to kill Christians, throw them in jail. He later becomes this great missionary. Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned him deeply. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who were in scattered wept and mourned because they had lost their jobs. Those who had been scattered said, I'm not going to talk about God anymore because my house was taken away from me. Those who were scattered were so angry that their children or parents were taken from him that they left the faith. Wait, 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 wait. Actually, I need glasses, but uh, I didn't pick them up. So. But I got the prescription. Uh, verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. How often do we say, well, I'm sick with Jesus because he doesn't do things the way I want. Did anybody want to lose their family business handed down generation after generation? Did anybody want to lose their home? Did anybody want to have their wife dragged off, their husband dragged off? And yet everywhere they went, they preached the word because they believed it. I'm kind of letting that marinate because I don't know how to add any strength to what we just read. Let's live our lives for Jesus. Let's preach. Let's teach. Let's talk about Jesus. Acts 11, 19 through 26, continuing talking about this persecution. Now those who had been scattered, these people scattered by persecution in connection with Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch. And what did they do? Telling the message, well, this time only to the Jews. But see, they kept talking about Jesus. Even though they had lost everything, because of this message. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Je Greeks, Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Maybe if we stopped getting uh, upset with God, saying, well, I'm not going to church because he didn't do things the way I I'm not going to talk about Jesus because he's not. Maybe if we stopped demanding that God dance to our tune and we started being obedient to him, Maybe great numbers of people in the United States would turn to Jesus as well. Verse 22, news of this reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas, the son of encouragement, to Antioch to go check out what's going on with this Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus. When they arrived and saw the evidence of God's grace, don't you love to see the evidence of God's grace? The evidence of God's grace is a trophy of grace. What is a trophy of grace? It means somebody who's been living their life angry, against God. Maybe somebody who's been religious but hasn't humbled themselves to God. It's been somebody who's run their life into the ditch and a trophy of grace is now somebody who said, Lord, please forgive me. You're right and I'm wrong. And they're saved and they're brought into a relationship with him. I love to see evidence of grace. I love to see a life changed from one path to another path because of the blood of Jesus Christ. There's nothing like it. And they went and they saw evidence of God's grace. He was glad. And he encouraged all of them Take, take true to the Lord with all your hearts. 
He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord because of, his te- because of what he said. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, this enemy of the church. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul, who has now become a believer, met with the church and taught, and great numbers of people, see great numbers, great numbers, great numbers, three times, uh, people came to faith. The disciples were called Christians for the first time at Antioch. Isn't that cool? This is early history. We're talking about before the Christians were even called Christians. But they started to be called Christians then, and Christian meant a little Christ. People would look at him and say, wow, you're just like that Christ guy. Well, when they see us, they see the people at Foundation Bible Church, they see a lot of little Christs. Are we complaining about our hardship, or are we taking Jesus everywhere we go? Acts 13, 49, the, whole, the, the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Jesus started with 11. We've got 70, 100. Don't say we're too, ch- we're too small of a church to impact our region. Let's get out there and start talking about our faith to everyone we can. Is everybody tracking with me? Is everybody good? Amen? Let's hear that louder. Good? Amen? Amen. 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 Uh, 14, 21 through 23. They preached the good news in that city and won, again, a large number of the disciples when they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples, encouraging them, encouraging them what? To remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Let's put that on our sign out there. I, I don't see too many televangelists lead with that one. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in the church, and with prayer and fasting, they were serious about who they set up as elders, right, Bob? With prayer and fasting, they committed these men to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Acts 20, 24, however I consider my life, Paul's talking, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I can finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. And then, I'm going to, my last verse in Acts, but not my last verse, is Acts 24, 5, the charges against Paul. Uh, he's in front of the Roman governor, Felix, and he's the charge against him. They said about Paul, we have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among all the Jews all over the world. And I, want, I want you to think about it. From Joseph to, to David to, to even Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, all throughout the Old Testament, then to, to, to uh, the New Testament with Peter and Paul, God has a soft spot for troublemakers. Isn't that weird? God has done mo- most of his work through troublemakers in the Old Testament and New Testament. In other words, people who aren't hiding, wilting, sitting on the sidelines somewhere. Paul could go into his town and start a riot and couple weeks. I'm not advocating riots. I'm not, you know. But what I'm saying is share Jesus. And there there is going to be some trouble. And yet, and yet, do I love people enough to keep sharing? Hebrews 13, 7 through 8. I referenced this verse last week, this verse is. And we talked about this in Sunday school class. Oh, I like to, I like to hide sometimes and that's not right. The Bible says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of the way of their life. <clears throat> Imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, Christians are called to look up to their leaders. In somebody who's sharing the faith, what are they doing? Have they been more effective than I have? Uh, not so that we compare ourselves and feel inadequate or say, we, we all have different gifts, that's right, but still, we're all called to look up to our leaders uh, here's some things that have practical t- uh, tools in my life that I want to share with you. Practical tools and mindsets, okay? Maybe some of these will help you to share your faith. I've been trying to work on these things since grade school. First one, don't be a crafty salesman. No bait and switch. Uh, be upfront. Be honest. Uh, straightforward. You can't trick people into genuine faith anyways. Here's something I always keep in mind. God does not need your lies to build his kingdom. So just tell the truth. Uh, it's sometimes I've found in my life it's been easier for me to share the gospel. Uh, uh, one time I worked a night shift at a, at a gasoline station, and I would mop the floors. It was a convenience store in there, and I got to eat all the free popcorn I wanted because it's going to be thrown away anyways. And 
cleaned out the hot dog machine, and I'd listen to really heavy Christian music, and people would come in, and women would come in weeping. Uh, people coming in made their life decisions, and I'm this guy wearing a smock, mopping the floor. A guy came in bleeding once. He had just come from a robbery, and I would talk to him about Jesus. And people started to come in just to talk to me. And one guy gave me one of the best compliments I've had in my life. He said, man, you're so easy to talk to. You should be a bartender. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I was just straightforward. I wanted people to become Christians, so it was easy for me to talk about Jesus. Nobody felt like I was trying to trick them. Oh, yeah, Dan wants me to become a Christian. So what do you expect out of Dan? But when you try to trick people subtly, I'm going to try to, then people said, wait, 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 what's this all about? You're trying to trick me. You, you want me to start talking about religion, right? So I, I just try to deal, I don't want to deal with the trick part. So I'm just up front. Yeah, I want you to be a Christian. I want everybody to become Christians. It's easier for me. Uh, second one, genuinely care about people. You can't fake love. And when you feel your heart is getting dry, I've cried to the point of tears sometimes. God, break my heart. I really want to love people. I want to care about people. Pray and ask God to give you love for people, even people who have treated you badly. Earn the right to invite. Now, if you're just do, handing out flyers downtown, you're not going to have a close connection with people. If you're going on doors, can I pray for you? That's fine. You, you, you could just, just invite them. But among friends and people that you get to know over time, you have to earn the right to invite. And that, that's not saying the first time you meet them, you can't say, I've got a great church, you want to come. But that invitation becomes more meaningful as you earn that right, as they get to know you genuinely care about them, that you love them. Love God, and you will love the people Christ died for. This is the third one. Love people, and you will want them to be with you in eternity. And it will break your heart to see people die or people live their lives without Jesus. Uh, next one, keep the spotlight on Jesus. And when I've asked people to write out their testimonies, I keep saying, you have to talk a little bit about how bad you were. <clears throat> but don't glory in how bad you were. We don't need to dwell in how bad you were. <clears throat> the spotlight's not on, Je not on you. Put the spotlight on Jesus. Not, the spotlight's not on how clever or talented we are sharing the gospel. <clears throat> not on how much we know. It's all about Jesus. And you and I, we can't save anybody's soul, which is a huge relief to me. Take away that burden. I can't save your soul, but Jesus can. So I don't have to say things perfectly. I just need to bring Jesus. Uh, next point, kiss. Keep it simple. No, saints. <laughs> Come on, we're at church. Uh, keep it simple, saints. Uh, don't make it so complicated. Just share the love of Jesus. Just share Jesus. Next one, give people a chance to pray with you to accept God. We already talked about that. Don't just share. Give an invitation. Don't suffer paralysis by analysis. Sometimes we're, oh, but I don't know if they'll really believe. I don't know if they're really ready. And so we wait and wait and wait. I often wait because I want, instead of me imposing me, myself on them, I want them to desire this from themselves. When I know I'm going to be meeting with somebody, you know, on a weekly basis for a period of time, I, I often give them a chance to grow into this. However, we can, we can make ourselves useless to Jesus. I've shared the gospel with a lot of people. Ten people accepted the Lord, but only one still walking. So there was nine people out there who just faked. So I guess it wasn't real. And now I just don't want to share my faith with anybody anymore. Brothers and sisters, Jesus gave communion to Judas. Keep handing out the invitation. Keep inviting people to Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible says that at the end times, God's going to sort out who really believes and who doesn't. Our job right now, keep sharing that gospel. And we'll see who's good soil, who's shallow soil. We'll see where the, where, the soil, where the seed grows and takes root or where the birds of the air come and snatch it away. We'll see, but if we don't share, we'll never see. Start sharing. Let God sort out the rest. That's not your job. If people pray with you and it turns out maybe they weren't really saved, that's, you still did the right thing. You did the right thing to share your faith. Keep doing it. Uh, another one I'm real big on this is uh, avoid cliches. I know people mean well when they say things like everything happens for a reason, but if you're hurting, I don't like to hear that, and I'm a Christian. I don't think non-Christians like to hear that. Every cloud has a silver lining. Listen, 
We have a real world with real hardship and pain and, and broken dreams. And I believe we're bringing a real God that really loves people. Let's bring this real. Let's not give them platitudes. Let's give them Jesus, a God who loved them enough to die for them, a God who hated death so much he went to the cross to defeat it, a God who understands sin and nastiness and brokenness. And you think, who could ever love me? And he's sitting right next to you, and he's got nails in his hands to prove that he loves you. Let's bring a real truth, a real Jesus, and not a simple, just, just smile, perk up, be cheerful. I, I can't stand that. That's not the gospel. What a cheap substitute to give to somebody. When you have the gospel, the living, when you have the truth of the living God in your heart and all you share is platitudes, shame on you. Uh, another one that I try to keep in mind is... Uh, Answer people's questions when they have them, but keep bringing it back to the cross, if you can answer, but keep bringing it back to the cross. Uh, otherwise, sometimes the air gets, you know, sometimes people are just trying to dodge, and we need to keep bringing it back to the cross. Jesus loved you. He died for you. You need to get right with him. Uh, love the lost more than, you, than I love my own comfort zone. And that, all, that has been coming to me since maybe high school, uh, when I started sharing my faith a lot more, and it stuck with me all these years. When I feel an opportunity to share the gospel and I feel like my flesh doesn't want to do something, the flesh never wants to do anything uncomfortable. You notice that? Your flesh never says like, oh, now's a good time to risk being embarrassed for Jesus. Your flesh never wants it. So when I feel that inside of me, like I want to hide my Bible, I don't want to talk about Jesus, Dan, are you going to love them more than you love your own comfort zone? Well, yes, I will, Jesus, and thank you for reminding me. And then we talk. Uh, if you feel like you really don't want to mention Jesus, it's probably a good sign that you should. Be willing to be thought of as a fool for 99 people because the 100th per person just might come to Jesus. I, sometimes I wonder if you guys think Dan thinks he's cool up here. No, I know I'm acting like a fool. I'm doing anything I can to make it easier to listen to me. I'm doing anything ridiculous I can, uh, silly that I can, in order to help people hear and, and listen. If 100 people think I'm a fool, that's okay. He loves me. But if I die and go to heaven, I look over, oh, you were listening? I didn't even know you were listening. And there's somebody there because I didn't shut up, because I wasn't worried about being a fool. Do you think in heaven I'm going to say, oh, I just hate all those times I witnessed Jesus Christ? Of course not. Of course not. Be willing to be a fool for Jesus Christ. Uh, again, we're, we, we've hit on some of these, but going quickly, don't worry about saying just the right thing. Pray and talk from your heart. I always tell people, even new Christians, just talk from your heart. Just say how much you love Jesus. Just say how much he's done in your life. Uh, next one, don't get defensive. Nothing worse than a defensive Christian, right? Uh, you don't have to defend America. You don't have to defend traditional values. You don't even have to defend uh, the church. Admit we're all sinners and then bring it back to the cross. And don't try to become popular with non-Christians by throwing other Christians under the bus. Oh, yeah, they're like that, but I'm not like that. And heaven is saying, yay, way to throw my kids underneath the wheels. No, don't gain popularity or with some people who don't really love Jesus anyways by throwing other Christians under the bus. Uh, don't get defensive. We don't have to do that. Uh, keep in mind that the person you're talking to uh, may not be the only person who's listening. Like when I was talking to Muslims and this Hindu fellow was listening. Uh, I've shared this story before, a fellow at Great Commission. Uh, this is a cool story. He, he was praying for, for a long time, a couple years, to share his faith with a friend. And so he, he finally felt, God, God told me to go do this. He thought, God wants me to share my faith with his friend. His friend was, worked at a car dealer. So he went to the car dealership, it was big and fancy, and he's starting to get a little scared, and each of these guys are sitting in their cubicle, and he has to wait, and he goes and goes and talks with his friend, and he, he just feels this, God wants me to share my faith with him. And he laid down the whole gospel, you're a sinner, we can't save ourselves, Jesus Christ provided that bridge, and, and by faith we can be forgiven. He shares everything with joy in his heart. His friend listens. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. He thought, God... I just prayed, Lord, well, I thought you wanted me here. And he got up and, and thought, well, maybe I'm just planting a seed for later. And he gets up, he's walking by, and a guy says, wait a second. He's in the cubicle, next one over, his own office. I was listening to everything you said. 
He came in, he prayed with that guy, and that guy became a Christian. Sometimes uh, when I was at working at uh, the, the Gazette and I was stuffing advertisements in it at nights, we had to go fast and you had to be careful not to talk too much. But across the line from me was a guy who was uh, homosexual and very like adamant about it, hated Christianity, but he thought he liked me. And I said, I'm not, really, I'm not that different than other Christians. You like me because you got to meet me. You got to get out more, meet more people, you know. But I loved him and he liked me. And so I would share him the gospel and I knew he was rock. His heart was like a rock. I prayed for him, but I was sharing actually for the other people that were listening. He was hard-hearted, and he kept asking me questions. But the thing is, he kept asking, we kept drawing out, and I was able to share the gospel to a room full of like 30 or 40 people as we were working full speed. Uh, and so you're not always just talking to one person. Maybe you're talking to that person's family members or somebody else who can overhear what you're talking about. Keep in mind that you may not get to see the harvest. Uh, I can remember one person, a... <clears throat> a wealthy lady, and I was sharing the, the gospel with her and her husband, and, and she would come with tears in her eyes, and she was so close to becoming a Christian. I, I told an older fella, I think she's close to being a Christian. She oh, no way. He laughed at me. No way she'd ever become a Christian. No way. And then a famous pastor who was, like, on the radio and everything came through, and this fella got the famous pastor to talk with her, and, uh, you know, he had a big ministry, and, and he came to me. I don't know how, but suddenly she just became a Christian. The famous pastor talked to her, and it's like she just became, uh, I've been having Bible studies with her for months. <laughs> it, so, you know, you don't always get to reap it. You don't always get to be the last domino, but be a part of the process. And sometimes you just share Jesus, and who knows? Somewhere down the line, that person uh, uh, may, in fact, put their faith in Jesus Christ, but we have to do our part and keep sharing. I'm almost done for today, and then we've got a lot more next week, but please come anyways, uh, even though it's going to be long. Uh, pray, especially if you find yourself being tight or defensive. But keep praying. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not our work. Keep praying. Uh, make Christ attractive by your attitude and behavior. If you're condescending, you know, you can't be a missionary and go overseas and be the white man bringing truth. You have to come in alongside people. And we're missionaries to our culture. Come in alongside people, not above people. If you're condescending, nobody's going to be able to listen to you. You have to understand that I'm a sinner saved by grace. One beggar. Uh, talking to another beggar about where to find this unbelievable feast that we have in the Lord. So make Christ attractive by our attitude and behavior. So always think that. I want to make Christ attractive. Listen, real quick. If my passion is evangelism, it changes everything else in my life. Because who am I going to, get to, mar who am I going to marry? Well, this person doesn't care about the Lord or about evangelism. I won't be able to build a godly family that's going to show other people what it looks like. How about I spend my time? How about the way I talk? How about my hobbies and my priorities? Everything gets in line with Christ when we start to put sharing our faith a priority because you say, I don't, want to, I don't want to make Christ look bad. And it changes then our behavior and the things that we do. Uh, so the next one, be a blessing. We, we're always praying, God bless me, bless me, bless me. That is fine. He loves you. He's our loving Heavenly Father. God bless me. There, I just did it. Uh, but... But listen, let's pray to be a blessing for other people. And I often pray that, uh, God, I don't want to be a curse to my kids and my wife today. Lord God, please don't let me be a curse to my church because I feel a bad attitude coming on. Lord, I'm so tired. Don't let me be a curse to the people around me. Lord, I want to be a blessing to the people in the Department of Motor Vehicles line. Yeah. I want to be a blessing. I want to bring an encouragement everywhere I go, in, in the grocery store, when I'm driving. That's a hard one, right? Want to be a blessing, not a curse. Ask God to send you opportunities to share the good news. And I have a lot of cool stories about asking God, and boom, immediately he provided somebody to talk to. And I'm going to share those next week. Let's go, church. Let's go. Jesus said, go. Let's go. Let's love people enough to bring Jesus everywhere we go. And we're going to fill up this church with people that people right here have invited this week. Uh, and not only invite to church, but say, can I pray with you? Don't you want to get this? Don't you want to get right with Jesus? Let's just pray together. Let's get this done. And then you're going to call me. And you say, guess what just happened? And uh, Aaron had an opportunity to do that with a couple times in the last year. Tell me, guess what just happened? And today, Sandy told me just before I got up here to preach, guess what just happened? And she had just prayed with a girl that I had spoken to about Jesus. She had just prayed with her and got to uh, invite her to the Lord. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah.
Thank you, Sandy, and thank you, Jesus, right? Amen. God's good. Let's keep sharing that gospel. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you, and we want to show that love to you by bringing your love to others. We know you care about the whole world. Father, here we are. We're weak. We don't have our everything all together, but Father, please use us and give us strength, give us wisdom, give us a lot more love, give us a passion that's worth sharing, something that we can't help but talk about. Help us to take this to our workplace, to our friends, to our family, to our neighbors, to the marketplace, online and, and brick and mortar, everywhere we go, Lord, help us to bring Jesus. And Father, Please prepare people's hearts even now to receive the good news, the message of the cross of Christ. Lord, we love you, and we really need help to love you more. Amen. Hello, my name is Pastor Dan Wolf from Foundation Bible Church. Thank you for watching Foundation Television. Uh, the reason our church does this is so we can reach out into our community and share the love of Jesus Christ. We have a good God. We have a God who loves us, a real God who really cares. And it's, he's put it on our hearts to try and uh, share this message that God is there for people, that there is God who's willing to meet them where they are at and to love them and forgive them. But it's also on my heart that uh, there's parts of church that you just, uh, you just can't experience in front of a television screen or on a computer screen. Uh, Jesus wants us to come together as one family, all different kinds of people from different nationalities, different income levels, different education levels, maybe people that normally wouldn't even uh, hang out outside of a church setting, but we're united by Jesus and he brings us all together. But I really want to encourage you, if you're able to, to take that step, leave your comfort zone at home, uh, find a good church to go to. We have so many good churches in the area. And I'm sure you're going to go there, you're going to be loved, you're going to be blessed, you're going to be encouraged, people are going to care about you. There's no reason we have to do life alone at home, but we can get out and meet with other people who are on this journey to, to, to know God better and to allow Him to reach into our lives and, and uh, let His grace rest upon our lives. So uh, again, I just want to encourage you, thank you for watching, but if you can get out on a Sunday morning, boy, we would love to see you. Thank you. Hi, this is John with Foundation TV. You know, Foundation Church is a small church uh, here in Janesville. We do a lot with the size of the congregation that we have. Uh, and we've been really pleased to host Foundation TV for many years. Uh, however, due to budget constraints, we're no longer able to do that at this time. Uh, if you would like to find Foundation TV, we're still available on YouTube uh, at the address below and on local access channels 98 and in HD 994. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.